this leftist ideologues since independence have been uh, running as like a parallel administrative network across india they are lending their voice and support to the secessionist attitudes they have been creating a narrative which is like always anti indian we are forced to look back into their background examine their ideology and question their intents and motives they are not committed to india it is only that they want to push their ideology and turn the nation into another communist nation at the outset i i would like to thank uh, srijan foundation and rahul devan ji for in my inviting me over here to give this talk and i would like to thank uh, mind makers for their constant support and encouragement uh, today i am going to talk about dissent this is absolutely going to be my own perspective of board dissent and how it's going to affect india or what it is about like uh, dissent that is making a fraction or a lobby in india quite rattled okay to start with india is a very free democratic country and the constitution of india has guaranteed freedom of speech under article 19 itself right from the inception but in 1950 owing to the sh uh, shrill cries from the princely state about secession government has like again had to rethink like what should be done about that at that juncture they have introduced the first amendment and that they have made the amendment under article 19 again so under article 19 2 they have imposed certain restrictions or limitations to this freedom of speech as you know freedom of speech cannot be absolute and none of the countries across the world have absolute freedom of speech so to say so the restraints or the limitations which are being introduced under like uh, article 192 are like about things related to the security sovereignty of the country or friendly relations with the neighboring countries or the foreign states and then about po public policy morality and also about inciting violence so all these things have been the restraints which they have in included in article 192 so again coming to uh, freedom of speech uh, across the world in the sense like uh, even internationally also any incitement to genocide is a punishable offense and even in european law incitement of public to violence or like grossly trivializing genocide or the victims of war all these things are considered as offenses so this is to say that there is no part of the world where you have absolute freedom and freedom comes with some restraints though it's known that freedom would like uh, enhance the progress and development of nation it is what it is so when uh, by dissent india is further india is like <coughs> reminded of only one major instance that is the emergency so uh, on june 25 1975 india uh, indira gandhi has imposed emergency and that was like to curb the rising political dissent against her the dissent in terms of opposition parties coming together and then asking men um, um, men uh, all the uh, opposition parties have come together and wanted to change the regime or wanted to have a change of regime but notably here also they wanted to have a change of re regime democratically but not with arms resistance or an arms use of arms struggle so indira gandhi like uh, introduced the undermining the cabinet without taking any decision or reducing cabinet to nothing she went ahead to uh, and directly approached uh, president fakhruddin ali ahmed and then got the presidential order for introducing the emergency and then Uh, the rest is history like in the sense like within two days of imposition of uh, 
uh, emergency all the all the political party leaders or the major opposition leaders were jailed in uh, during the emergency press was censored uh, civil liberties were suspended and like uh, uh, you, you have absolutely like there is absolute no room for any dissent or any kind of an alternative opinion to be like uh, entertained so that was the thing that existed and even now after seven uh, I mean after 40 years of emergency people are dissent is dissent people account it or like are in my are immediately reminded of only the emergency so that was the first instance and uh, um after that like uh, i mean uh, i wanted to stress this aspect more because to say that like india hasn't ever repressed or like it has na never oppressed any section even so after uh, emergency also there were number of rallies protests demonstrations and people were free to voice their opinions and actually i want to remind you like in 1988 mahendra singh tekat a jat farmer uh, fur farmers rights have like uh, launched a protest in boat club near boat club wherein like 5 lakh farmers have descended on capital and they have occupied the uh, plush lawns of india gate people were really I mean, confused like what is happening and how come like these many people have come and all that after that they have uh, I men uh, with five lakh people uh, five lakh people completely occupying the center of the city city has come uh, city has been paralyzed later they have uh, men uh, come to a conclusion that there should be specific places for dissent so from then onwards their uh, uh, government has allotted specific places for public dissent those include the ramlila maidan jantar mandar and patel chest hospital and these things but uh, this is all to say that like number of rallies demonstrations protests have ever been happening in the country and it has been a regular event or the regular process even lately like um, in 2016 uh, ngt has asked supreme court to impose a ban mm -hmm. on protests uh, even in jantar mandar but then Su uh, supreme court has ruled against ngt and said like uh, we are going to have a specific or allotted places for dissent and that is going to remain there i'm going to stress this aspect once again because it has happened in 2016 and the dissent or a specific group of people which have been targeting the current regime for being repressive hasn't like even under the new regime nothing has changed it, the dissent has been there and they were having the space which they had earlier so coming to the things like why the dissent or the cry for dissent or repression is now hitting the headlines so uh, so to say the uh, the intellectual cabal or the leftists or whatever you can say they were like really um, men what do you say flabbergasted at like uh, uh, narendra modi's victory be, uh, and what has happened in 2014 is phenomenal in the sense like it was for the first time center of right party has come to power with absolute majority so till then like even uh, most of the times it was like center of uh, right sorry center of left which has been ruling india so it didn't make any much difference to this entire cabal so they and most of the dissenting voices actually so to speak had like a kind of a personal hatred or enmity and also they felt threatened in the sense like for the past six decades only one narrative used to dominate the political discourse or the cultural discourse so to say every aspect of the governance are the administration so 
I mean, it is like quite puzzling in the sense, like for a country of 1.3 billion, it's like, uh, I mean, it's unimaginable that there, there can't be any alternative narratives. But uh, it so happened that for the past six decades, only one narrative has dominated. And all other narratives or the alternative narratives are scuttled and then they weren't given their space or they were forcibly restrained even sometimes. So that was the case and that meant, uh, so 2014 has been the watershed moment for India, I should say. And after that, it so happened like uh, uh, within a year of uh, Narendra Modi taking into power, uh, this cabal felt rattled in the sense for the first time, like they were feeling the pressure of being checked because uh, some of these people, intellectuals or the leftists, um, they were feeling the pressure in the sense like for the first time foreign funds are being scrutinized and they were like not allowed to have the men the kind of a freedom with which they used to get the uh, funds from abroad that was one reason like um, they were uh, waiting for a chance like how to like uh, men uh, create a kind of a confusion in the society even before that even just before narendra modi can uh, could take oath um, media is flooded with so many opinion pieces and people warning them saying that country is going to fail, go through dire circumstances and like um, there uh, and uh, uh, without even having an idea about how country is going to be administered they have passed out a blanket statements or sweeping judgments saying that like they go, they are going to be massive rights they are going to be civil disorder in the society law enforcement will be severely crippled and things like that so that was the first alarm they have raised against this government and after that it continued and i would like to say that there were like actually so to speak three rounds of um, dissent the first one I could say is like in 2015, which started with the award Vapasi movement. So the award Vapasi movement, I should say, because like um, it was uh, uh, spearheaded by like Nayantara cycle, uh, uh, niece of uh, late uh, Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru. And like um, it's so surprising, like uh, being a Kashmiri, she was never offended by uh, the genocide against the Kashmiris. Kashmiris were driven away from their fa from their well, places and then they are mm, made to flood away. But nothing has affected her. And uh, she has received Sahitya Academy Award in 1986. And then just two years before like uh, uh, six were like uh, massacred in the national capital region but that hasn't even affected her and little going back little uh, further like even during emergency like around 4.3 million people were sterilized even that couldn't like uh, really affect the conscience of these artists or writers or like uh, film uh, producers who at once have like declared that country is going through the most intolerant phase or this was uh, or this is the most intolerant regime in the independent India. So around uh, 40 uh, around 50 people have like uh, written their Sahitya Academy Awards saying that uh, the government is repressive and it's fascist and then like their conscience doesn't permit them to have this kind of an award but surprisingly none of them have given back their financial incentives or perks from the government or none of them have resigned so to say that has been the case and uh, 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 and the cabal for the first time like had a kind of a success in the with this kind of a movement or the ripples which they have created across the nation in the sense like uh, uh, their voices were noticed 
even these things are being highlighted across national and international media there were debates uh, held wide wide range of debates were held discussing like whether india is really uh, uh, at the danger of slipping into an authoritative regime and things like that so but uh, nothing of that sort has ever happened and since then they have been targeting each and every incident they have been randomly choosing and picking up incidents that would choose their narrative so immediately after september uh, uh, 2015 the first thing they have picked up was like uh, they targeted maharashtra state government for imposing meat ban for 8 days and this has been happening since a long time in the sense like from the congress days but never there has been hue or cry about this issue and this 8 day meat ban is to honor the sentiments of jains like uh, that is with regard to the paryushan thing where they uh, it is like uh, an 8 day um uh, uh, regime of uh, intense uh, uh prayer repentance and reflection so in on uh, honoring those sentiments of change um, maharashtra government has been following that and this was immediately followed by like uh, uh, a kind of a protest in uh, iit madras where they have raised voices against uh, or like uh, rather they have uh, come down heavily on ministry of uh, human resources for stop uh, for banning them from uh, uh, having ambedkar periyar group in the campus and uh, after that it just continued like uh, they have targeted like uh, uh, random aspects in the sense like uh, incidents where like dalits were dalits have been the victims or like uh, muslims have been victims and that has been a selective outrage like they have continued that selective outrage which like um, uh, again it has uh, reached to a crescendo in uh, uh, january 26 with the suicide of uh, rohit vemula where they allege that uh, this has been a dalit repression um i mean i had to stress up on this issue again once again because like a uh, uh, 20 year old abhishek a hindu boy who has also committed uh, suicide in shringeri at the same time was like received no mention anywhere it's like only the selective instances like uh, people have been like uh, trying to project so that has been one of the uh, instance and then like uh, uh, after that like uh, um, it um, uh, right like li- right after january again in national capital region they have targeted uh, shri shri for uh, uh, conducting this uh, world cultural festival on um, on banks of yamuna saying that it's going to have a very serious effect on the ecosystem on the river ecosystem but like uh, men uh, months after the uh, conference the foundation had successfully proved that nothing has been affected but what remains is to say that like uh, their uh, outrage or like uh, their angst with government has been so selective that has been always to foster their narrative or to present that like they have been facing that kind of a repression and things have changed in the present system that is one thing and uh, again going back to dissent i just want to remind people like uh, even our freedom struggle has been like an iconic reflection of dissent and most of the tallest leaders of our country were greatest dissenters and uh, going men coming back like again to 2011 like um, when you see that uh, uh, men the aam aadmi party is the one which has come out or had its genesis from the dissent like india against corruption is not has like uh, transformed into this political party aam aadmi party 
So it's all to say that India as such has been an accommodating society, a free society and had never repressed any kinds of voices as such. It has always thrived in diversity. So this portrayal of sudden intolerance is like a really sometimes seems to be imaginative or sometimes it seems like they are trying to push a kind of a narrative to say that like something has become grossly wrong after 2014. So going further, um, even like uh, during the same period, like um, around two, 2016 itself, um, there have been massive riots in UP and then uh, Hindus have flood after Kairana riots and there, and there are reports saying that like the entire village has migrated. That was like uh, the kind of a fear that was instilled in Hindu community that like uh, the entire village itself has moved. And uh, uh, surprisingly all these people who say that it is about human rights and things like that, none of them has raised voice against uh, illegal detention of Kamlesh Tiwari who has been rotting in jail since like uh, 2016 January. And even there is no like uh, um, when you are cry about uh, Dalagar rights or Kalya Chok rights or like uh, uh, the kind of uh, uh, men, uh, thing which was suffered by school students in West Bengal when they were about to celebrate Saraswati Puja. They, uh, they were like, uh, they were not allowed to perform Saraswati Puja and they were sent back homes. So these were the kinds of the things which are like, uh, um, I mean, happily pushed under carpet and only certain things are being projected. It's not to say that everything has been like really bright and glorious after 2014, but it's only that uh, selective portrayal, which is like uh, um, making rounds and which is like really harming um, India's like uh, image even in the external world and then after that like uh, um, uh, in 2018 that is where like the current uh, this thing has like really come up in July in January uh, on January 2nd Koregaon uh, Bhima protests like uh, um, like even before that I just wanted to say that like uh, um, uh, this cabal has been interfering in assembly elections and uh, in every possible way to create a kind of a chaos. They have been like supporting people who are demanding reservations and they have been uh, encourage, uh, joining people who are protesting against government for various reasons. So they have been adding their heft behind all these protests. So that is a reason for cause of concern in the sense because this has even spilled into the uh, uh, Koregaon Bhima case where like uh, in 2018 to commemorate the bicentennial celebrations when they have uh, when the Dalits have taken out rallies what what had to be a peaceful protest has turned into turned violent protesters started blocking roads even the trains were not allowed to uh, uh, like uh, pass and the city has been completely paralyzed and random mobs have infiltrated these protesters uh, public properties or the vehicles were torched and and this has eventually led to the murder of a 20 year old youth following these events maharashtra government has uh, start uh, has ordered for an investigation about these events and from these events it has emerged that just days days before this rally intellectual uh, like um, to be more specific uh, omar khaled and jignesh mevani had uh, given rousing sp uh, speeches which has led to this kind of uh, violence or spillover of violence in these peaceful protests so like uh, after some uh, a couple of FIRs were fi uh, filed against the violence, 
the government has instituted the investigation which has led them to nail five uh, Maoist activists and these were like uh, I'm just trying to read out their organization names because they are uh, because uh, later in the later in my talk I'm going to connect all these dots like how they are related like all the, you know, these people included like uh, Sudhir Tawle, Antachi Chalwal from Republican Panthers Jati, Sudhir Gardling, Indian Association of Pro People's Lawyers, and Rona Wilson uh, and Soma Shen of Committee for Release of Political Prisoners, and Mahesh Rath who has been former uh, Rural Development Fellow under Prime Minister program. So like uh, this has, uh, so uh, after uh, um, when all these five people were taken into detention and further investigations have revealed that they are going to, uh, uh, they are planning a larger plot. And from the uh, laptop of Rona Wilson, they have recovered a email address to comrade Prakash where they have say, uh, where they have discussed like how india is turning into a fascist regime under modi because with Bo with the bjp already uh, in power in 15 con uh, 15 states it's like uh, sooner the country is going to turn into a men uh, a completely going to turn into a fascist country so they are feeling the heat of it and they also discussed about uh, release of uh, GN Sai Baba who is like a Maoist activist and then like uh, there were talks about saying like uh, that they needed 8 crores to buy M4 rifles and then uh, some 5 lakh rounds of bullets and towards the end they were saying that like uh, they were even planning an assassination plot uh, similar to Rajiv Gandhi's assassination. So this has caused a real like uh, this has alerted the Maharashtra police who went on further and then all these leads have led them to arrest five uh, men so called intellectuals or the lawyers or the human rights activists. It is then that the entire uh, uh, narrative of dissent has again uh, received a shot in the arm, so to say, uh, because they have uh, like uh, rose to the occasion and then started condemning government that like uh, dissent is being repressed. Such is the intensity of the dissent like uh, uh, when, pol uh, when Maharashtra police have obtained uh, transit uh, uh, remand from Sake district government within no time like uh, or uh, rather to, to be more specific on like uh, by 4 a.m. the next day Justice um, S. Murlidhar I had called for an urgent intervention of uh, Delhi High Court and by 6 a.m. they have can suspended this bail orders saying that uh, uh, all the documents which were produced in Maharashtra um, in Marathi are like difficult to decipher and then like certain procedures are not followed. This is to say that like even within like in less than 24 hours the entire network has become active and they have reached the Delhi High Court and stopped the arrest of uh, Gautam Navlaka and Sudha Bharatwaj. The other two other three people like Arun Ferreira, Vernon Gonzalez and Varvar Rao they were already taken into custody and these were the five people who police believed had the crucial leads about the kind of a plot they were uh, going to hatch or like about more details about the whole intricate thing. So uh, this is uh, 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 it is like uh, the entire outrage now is like about uh, saying is like uh, uh, based on uh, their a narrative that government has become a totalitarian state um, 
indicating that like uh, Gautam Naulaka as they have projected has been like uh, they say that it, he is the editorial consultant of EPW and uh, Sudha Bharatwaj they say is like a visiting professor of uh, National Law University and uh, they questioned the government like why they had to come down on these individuals but when you dig deep it emerges that Gautam Naulaka has got so many dubious connections in the sense like uh, there is one organization called uh, that is like a CDR Committee for Democratic uh, Rights Organization. It's the mother organization and it has got uh, 20 different branches and each of these branches are handling different aspects. So now I'll place how these organizations are pushing around their narrative or getting their things done. So the first one is uh, uh, Jammu Kashmir Coalition of Civil Societies. And this uh, organization regularly organizes meetings in uh, Srinagar. And the main speaker has been like, or the one of the main speaker has been Arundhati Roy. And uh, back in 2011, Arundhati Rai, when she was even, I guess she has been like uh, then nominated as interlocutor for uh, Jammu and Kashmir as well. She then has said like uh, Kashmir, um, uh, Kashmir has every right to to decide its own fate. So to say that Kashmir is now ready for a referendum, and the Muslims there have right to self-determination and she also say uh, said that like um, soon after india has got independent it has turned into an imperialist state and another thing which this uh, organization has been constantly pushing is to say that they always um, refer to kashmir as india administered kashmir and now they have even joined Jammu to the same thing. So to say that like even Jammu and Kashmir is being administered by India. In other words, it's to say that it's a disputed, uh, a disputed territory, reinforcing like Pakistan's way of putting things. So now bringing back Gautam Naulaka into this picture, uh, he is also closely associated with this uh, JKCCS and um, back in 2011 uh, uh, Farooq Abdullah, Chief Minister of uh, Jammu Kashmir has uh, issued uh, orders to the police preventing his entry into the state. So why is that like a Chief Minister has asked a private person not to be to prevent uh, like uh, to be stopped from entering into Jammu and Kashmir because like he has been constantly advocating the referendum for Kashmir. That is one reason. And another aspect of it is like, uh, uh, like it's actually to say, to say it's a Pandora box and it uh, opened up when like uh, Gulam Nabi Fai who was operating in US was um, arrested by like uh, CIA under the charges of running a Jammu Kashmir Atom uh, Atomic Council, an NGO organization funded by ISL. And then he spilled, he spilled beans saying that like he was introduced, uh, he was asked to recruit Gautam Naulaka into the NGO uh, on the recommendations of ISI of Pakistan. So these are the connections that a random private person has been having so that is one aspect and uh, uh, another thing which I want to uh, focus is like uh, to just give you an idea of how intricately these people are connected and how well placed these are um, uh, just as I said like uh, Gautam Naulaka was even uh, men Mm, even hardly uh, held under detention for hours and high court was forced uh, to deliver a judgment on this because of uh, justice Murli Dhar Rao. 
So it happens that Murli Dar Rao's wife Usha Ramnathan is a colleague of Gautam Naulaka, and both of uh, them have worked together for both Bhopal gas victims case. And uh, another like uh, what should I say? Adding more details to that, even Kavita Krishna Krishnan has been an associate of these two people in Bhopal gas victims case. So this is the kind of uh, network which is there. And now coming to Sudha Bharatwaj, people like especially Twitterate were like uh, really agonized, and then like uh, they have uh, flooded uh, the Twitter with lots of message, but uh, saying that Shura, Sudha Bharatwaj has been an upright woman. And uh, having born in America, she has uh, given up everything, has come down to India and has settled. And she has been doing phenomenal service as a human rights activist. Okay, so it, uh, I just wanted to say about uh, her, um, about two things. She is associated with an organization called, uh, um, uh, just to say, like uh, PUCL. That is like a People's Union for Civil Liber Liberties. She is General Secretary of PUCL, which is another organization linked to CDR, which I have mentioned is the mother organization. So uh, what she has been doing in Chhattisgarh is like uh, she, has an, uh, she has an initiative called Jaglak. That is like Jagdalpur Legal uh, action, uh, action Group which provides legal services to all these Naxalites. And she has been at forefront in defending Dr. Binayak Sen, who was convicted as a Maoist activist. And he has committed so many anti-national activities. But, uh, and these people are associated in the sense like uh, Sura, uh, Sudha Bharat was is general secretary for PUCL. And Binayak Sen is vice chair, uh, vice president of PUCL. Okay, and uh, one uh, uh, the West Bengal Charter of PUCL has even published a book exonerating Binayak Sen of all these crimes. So this is a parallel thing which always goes on with these organizations. Like they bring out pamphlets, books, and like uh, they constantly hold workshops, conference, meetings uh, to say that what they are saying is really true. And then they support their narratives with so many uh, supportive evidences and stunts. Uh, that is about those two. And then the third one is Arun Pereira. Arun Pereira is one like uh, he is associated with uh, another organization that is PUDR that is People's Union for Democratic Rights. So P PUDR is like uh, Gautam Naulaka is associated with this PUDR as well. So Arun Farera has been like uh, an executive member of that uh, uh, organization. And uh, uh, of all the five individuals which I have uh, mentioned earlier, all the four, four of them have been uh, arrested number of times under various sections even in earlier UPA regime also under the UAPA Act in the sense Unlawful Activities Prevention Act. Um, so like uh, uh, so now crying foul like uh, the government is repressive and then it's coming on us very heavily it holds no ground. Um, uh, there is one more organization that has been also actively working that is like uh, uh, People's, uh, People's Union for Release of uh, uh, Political Prisoners. So uh, what about this organization? This has been at act, uh, forefront in condemning the Nirbhaya rape victims in the sense to say that like uh, um, hanging of Nirbhaya victims. Uh, rape victims is not going to be a moment of celebration. They have even condemned the um, hanging of uh, Asmal Kasa and also said like uh, 2000 uh, men, 2000 
eight uh, Mumbai right, uh, Mumbai attacks have not been an uh, or not attacks which were launched by Pakistan. So this was the kind of a narrative that they were like trying to push and all other organizations which I have mentioned have been like either condemning one or two uh, in the sense like um, uh, uh, PUCL has been outrightly condemning hanging of uh, Yakub Menon and the other organization uh, PUDR has been like uh, it has worked actively uh, uh, in like um, in um, I mean denying the or like uh, so to say giving a free cheat to us uh, Afzal Guru and things like that so it is like uh, uh, a, the left all these organization basically are affiliated to the leftist ideology and uh, this um, this leftist ideologues since independence have been uh, running as like a parallel administrative network across india and they are highly organized and uh, uh, they all these organizations uh, receive foreign funds and um, uh, the kind of a commitment uh, the kind of uh, narratives they uh, like pedal or like uh, the arguments which they like put forth have been all the time constantly supported by their sister organizations uh, just as I said like uh, Jammu Kashmir uh, organization which has been uh, strengthening the aspirations of Kashmiri separatists uh, they have even uh, they have in the sense a greater influence in uh, uh, like shaping the opinions of Kashmiris um, it has now emerged like uh, um, some of the separatists openly say that if not for the Maoists, leftists and humanists nobody in India ever cares for Jammu and Kashmir Despite government allocating so many resources, none of these things are acknowledged or even like uh, um, the, uh, that sense of a belongingness to India has been slowly cut off or being gradually eroded of their minds by these kinds of organizations. Um, uh, this uh, why you why we have to take this network so seriously because like. Uh, this network has been hitting India, uh, India's roots in the sense like uh, they have been like uh, making uh, um, uh, synchronized or bringing about synchronized movements that affects the societal aspects, the cultural aspects and the national security aspects. National security aspect uh, uh, first I have emphasized about Jammu and Kashmir now they have another organization called uh, COHR like coordinated organization for human rights so that is very active in Manipur so they work with the people in Manipur and then they strongly support Manipur self-determination right to self-determination they say that uh, Manipur has every right to have their own choice so so to say that they are lending their voice and support to the secessionist attitudes of the Northeast even the openly condemned government for carry for uh, killing this uh, Kaplong group of NSC and militants and they even urge people to protest against various developmental activities or construction of dams especially saying that it's going to affect their livelihoods so it is like slowly they are bringing uh, their men uh, with the informed uh, uh, men uh, through a rather a channelization of their thoughts or like through informed networks they have been creating a narrative which is like always anti-Indian so that is one aspect of uh, 
uh, the, uh, that is one reason why we should take this group so very seriously. Um, the another aspect of this national interest or uh, internal security is like uh, their brother in arms. Like these are rather called as urban Naxals. The rather new terminology which is given to them, but uh, this it has been an urban Naxalism in the sense, so to say that Marx Marx has always like uh, stressed on um, impressing his doctrine or ideology only to the urban people initially. So it has always been an urban movement. It has slowly moved into rural areas because like it has been uh, due to the influence of Mao. Mao has always uh, concentrated on like uh, um, uh, or rather to say that his ideology has been about uplifting of this peasants. So it has been a rural, mostly it is focused on a rural uh, network. So combining these two uh, people uh, or the leftist ideologues who are operating in India, they have this overground urban Naxals, what you can say as one arm um, and the rural uh, wing or the brothers in arms who like are into the real armed struggle against the government. So they are, they are no different, they are like very much interlinked. And again going back to, to reinforce my point, I just want to say that like uh, uh, Communist Party of India has uh, been had its uh, or rather started in India in 1921, 25 sorry. And from then onwards, they always they never had in like uh, a national outlook or so, so to say, they are. They were never bothered about India as a nation as such. They were always. They always held their ideology supreme, and they always worked for it. So India for them really made no sense. This I wanted to uh, men, uh, count support my points in the sense like uh, there were like. Uh, um, people like uh, uh, in a book called uh, Quit India Revolution, the Ethos of Its Central, direc uh, Central Direction by K.K. Chowdhury, he highlighted like what are the four objectives of uh, communists in India or the leftist ideology. They never believed that India was a nation but a collection of separate nationalities and they found that the belief uh, the demand for Pakistan is just democratic because Hindus would oppress them in future. Another thing was the Muslim League itself has become progressive, secular and Jinnah himself is secular and anti-religious. That is their belief. And then the fourth one is Congress must concede to Muslim, Muslims the right to self-determination. So these four points sum up to say what has been their objective. So it has never been about India or the country. And some of the people and uh, especially Baswa Punnaya, uh, one of the tall leaders in uh, Communist Party, he went on to even say that like uh, um, uh, regions in Northeast, Sikkim, Tibet, all should be under the control of Chinese because these regions are populated by people of Chinese descent. So that was the kind of a thing they have put, uh, they have like uh, really pursued. And uh, even like, uh, uh, I mean, if, even if we can dismiss this uh, random discussions about communists, in uh, 1944, Mahatma Gandhi himself has uh, questioned this communist leader P.C. Joshi on how they have betrayed the nation as such. Uh, uh, and uh, V. Sundaram, another columnist, he's, he always argued that uh, the left has uh, uh, acted as fifth column of British Empire. The reason for going back and referring to all these things has been because like now P 
people come back and answer like what this person has uh, what this political party has done during independence movement or what is their contribution and how committed uh, they are towards nation and things like that it's only after seeing these kind of uh, 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 questions being raised that we are forced to look back into their background examine their ideology and uh, question their intents and motives so um, uh, the other, um, so it is like uh, uh, like uh, I mean uh, the focus of all these groups uh, are uh, actually like uh, some of the Soviet archives even refer like uh, uh, the Mitrokin archive uh, clearly says that like how uh, Soviet Union has funded um, Communist Party in its, in its initial years and uh, Soviet Union and China has initially uh, impressed upon the Communist Party of India saying that like it's time that uh, they need to have some kind of uh, underground cells or combat cells if they really want to take on India. So to say that like they are not committed to India, it is only that they want to push their ideology and turn the nation into another communist nation. They have nothing to do with India as such. So that is one aspect and uh, this should always then uh, this uh, this again brings back uh, uh, communist take on um, Indochina war in 1962. People are even now people say that like across West Bengal there have been posters and banners saying that China's chairman is our chairman. And uh, uh, um, Jyoti Basu in 1900, uh, in 1962, when China is about to wage a war, said that like McMahon line is imaginary, and that like uh, China has been, uh, uh, China is ready to wage war on India because of India's narratives. So to say that like India's arguments have really angered China and that is the reason why China is like waging a war on India. So it is always that they have been like uh, uh, supporting the foreign countries be it Soviet Union or, uh, or China or like here in this case like uh, after India has strengthened itself or established itself as a free democratic country they are now seeking the support or they are mobilizing different uh, um, distressed fractions or the fractions which are like really upset with India. So to say that like they readily align with evangelists, uh, Islamists and even they support the Islamist search saying that it is the national movement against imperialism. So they support even Islamic up upsurge also. So they are in arms with every other force which is against India and uh, they are even now so so to say that uh, like uh, this dissent is like uh, really genuine it is absolutely not because uh, inherently when we go back to Marx he he said like India and China both countries have strong civilizational connect until unless these people are deracinated or alienated from their culture or religion no other ideology can thrive so the basic roots go back to the marxist ideology which has been constantly saying that like india as uh, uh, for uh, Marxism to thrive in India, people have to be alienated from their traditions, culture and civilizational, civilizational roots. So one of the basic uh, uh, agenda of, these, of this particular group is also waging war against Hindu fascism, what they call it as Hindu fascism or to stop saffronization and this saffronization we can now um, uh, bring to the kind of uh, thing which intellectuals say like if 
Sanskrit is added to our studies or introduced into our university studies, they would like raise a cry saying that government is trying to saffronize. So this saffronization has their roots in Marxism. So it is it has been their ideology to like uh, deracinate Hindus. So there are like various dimensions to this descent and this descent in fact holds no meaning because like uh, Freedom House, uh, an NGO which uh, ranks different nations across the world basing on their democratic rights, civil liberties, electoral process has uh, ranked India as a free country and it has given 77 out of 100 points saying that India is a free country. So, uh, so uh, this like wild fears or allegations have no ground. Now coming back to another aspect which these people have impacted is our electoral reforms. One of the organization of CDRO, PUCL has filed litigation in Supreme Court in 2013 uh, saying that NOTA should be introduced. And Supreme Court ruled in their favor as a consequence NOTA has been added to our is now part of our electoral process. They say that just as right to vote is fundamental right, right not to vote or negative vote is also a fundamental right. They say that it is right to dissent. So while everything seems to be okay with what they are saying, when you uh, go or uh, observe their press statement, it emerges that it is in line with CPI Maoist ideology saying that like people should not participate in elections or this is one way of saying no to elections. So this has been the underlying intent in pushing forward this nota. So now you men, I am stressing on this nota because like uh, in recent uh, Karnataka assembly elections, nota has been a game changer. Had it not been for nota, cephologists say that like uh, BJP would have emerged as the major majority party. So uh, these are the small small kind of interventions which, which they are making and they are and these small interventions are in fact making huge difference. And uh, another thing I wanted to say is like uh, Ha, huh, about this Ramajanma Bhumi issue case or the Ayodhya case. So uh, what has been their role in that? Uh, when we go back uh, in, uh, to 1906, uh, sorry, in 2016, Dr. K.K. K. Mohammed, who, who retired as uh, uh, Director General Archaeologist North of ASI, he in his autobiography has said like, uh, uh, in excavations done by a team led by Professor B. B. Lal, they have found like uh, 10 to 14 pillars of uh, uh, Hindu temple under the uh, temple uh, uh, under the mosque. So, but like uh, this, um, this news or like this information was like never brought to fore because like uh, uh, when leftist historians, Marxist historians rather, uh, Irfan Habib, Romila Thapar, Bipin Chandra in, intervened in between and uh, when Muslims were even ready for an amicable solution, they said like uh, those temples belong uh, of uh, which belong to 11th and 12th century might in fact be Jain temples. Or they rather said like uh, Ayodhya had been center for Hindus and Jains. So they have, uh, they have successfully convinced all these people from having an amicable solution on Ayodhya case also. And even they have actively participated in Bab Babri action committee meetings. So these are the various things that they have been doing and uh, I mean uh, 
सॉरी आई आई एम नॉट गोइंग इन ए क्रोनोलॉजिकल ऑर्डर बट देन टू टू सपोर्ट माय एग्जांपल्स और साइटेशंस वॉट एवर आई एम सेइंग आई एम जस्ट सेइंग दैट नॉट दैट लाइक ओनली द करंट डिस्पेंसेशन और लाइक द प्रेजेंट जेनेर ऑफ राइट विंगर्स और फाइंडिंग फॉर दिस विद दिस आइडियोलॉजी और विद दिस पर्टिकुलर ग्रुप बट देर आर सो मेनी इंस्टेंसेस विच हैव विच हैव रैदर अलर्टेड एस ऑफ दिस काइंड ऑफ हैपनिंग्स वे बैक इन नाइनटीन कांग्रेस प्रेसिडेंट पटाब सीतारामैया हैज रिजेक्टेड दैट कम्युनिस्ट पार्टीज बी एलेक्टेड टू पार्टिसिपेट इन जनरल इलेक्शंस इवन ही सेड दैट लाइक एट द हाइट ऑफ इंडिपेंडेंट मूवमेंट दे हैव लाइक रियली मीन सो टू से दैट लेट अस डाउन दे हैव इन गिवन सपोर्ट रैदर दे एक्टेड एज ब्रिटिश एजेंट्स एंड ही ऑल्सो अलर्टेड सींग दैट this group which has so many internal fissures and internal fractionization they will come together when they find a common enemy so those have those ha- have been the cryptic uh, hints which were left by those leaders and even in 1981 indira gandhi has uh, uh, come down on this communist heavily saying that in west bengal and tripura um the uh, the governments have been slowly staffing the administrative posts with their loyal cadres and she has also like raised alarm saying that they have been slowly making amendments in their textbooks and then and are trying to indoctrinate the students and this indoctrination phenomena is not new and we are facing that tr- problem and uh, since like i should say from rather 1970s all these textbooks have uh, undergone r- rapid changes and massive incorporations are made in which are like anti indian so and now the current breed of graduates which are emerging out of the top tier institutes have a narrative which is like uh, which doesn't have any which doesn't help them in connecting themselves with to their roots or they never have that sense of belongingness to india rather they are adept in finding faults with indian civilization like be it the caste system which they uh, always raise it as a scourge or evil on hindu society and things like that undermining the achievements and the success or the grandeur of the indian civilization so that is the cultural aspect which they have like strongly hit on another aspect is the uh, societal aspect the societal aspect is like uh, uh, repeated targeting of hindu festivals traditions and uh, people in the ncr might be knowing that last year we were not allowed to burn crackers on diwali thanks to the ngt and like the pil filed in supreme court so these are the small small kind of interventions which this kapal has been making and now to uh, say that uh, this is dissent and then we will we are and government is not letting us to have things in our own way has uh, really no meaning at all this this network has been active since uh, or for the past 8 decades and it is high time that uh, country raises to this knows the nuances of their functioning and uh, but uh, the take home message from this entire event is that like uh, the kapal has emerged as a strong network it has very deep links even not uh, not only with the forces within india which are anti indian forces but also with forces abroad uh, just to draw one more uh, uh, example or to substantiate my claim um uh, as i said earlier gn sai baba has been like uh, convicted of 
uh, of carry of uh, men for his uh, alleged Maoist links, not not alleged Maoist links, for his Maoist links. Sorry, and uh, we I mean it's surprising that like uh, uh, these people have petitioned to UN to intervene. And uh, even uh, quite lately, just in uh, uh, like uh, just a month ago, nine European parliamentarians have uh, uh, lodged a petition saying that EU should uh, severe its strains from uh, India because they are like curtailing or they are suppressing the free voices. It is with reference to the five people who were arrested in Bhima Koregaon case. And um, see the irony of the entire event, uh, like they have uh, I mean, uh, successfully diverted countries attention from as crucial aspect as assassination of a prime minister to some random thing saying that uh, their voices have been thwarted. So it is like uh, for us to understand that uh, all this outrage is actually fake. There is no meaning, no intent to it and India as a country is not going to get anything out of it. So, I mean, and another phenomenal example of same thing is this entire uh, cabal had um, uh, I mean, uh, through, uh, through their weight behind this uh, uh, JNU students who have raised anti-Indian slogans. Surprisingly, the same slogans were also were heard in the meetings held by Hafiz Sayyid. And these were men, I think anybody who has watched TV could have noticed that they were similar slogans. There wasn't anything different. These people were like occupying the, uh, they have penetrated if, uh, the Indian ecosystem. They are now in academic institutions, in administrations, in high authority posts. And they uh, have penetrated every other form of governance. And they are dictating terms to the government or rather to say that they say that what they are saying is right. They have been intolerant all the while. But they have been constantly saying that government has been intolerant. So this is the kind of a thing that has been happening. And uh, it is time that uh, we should really call the bluff of this cabal. And, uh, uh, but the take home message for all other people or especially for the right wingers is the kind of coordination synchronization they have and the way they can push their narratives. Uh, for instance, they first pick up a random event and then constantly uh, they hit the audience with the same idea from across different portals, be it press or the online portals, they hit upon uh, or they bring to fore that this has been happening. After that, they hold se series of meetings, conference, protests, agitation or the can or right now the fashionable thing, the candle marches. So to say, saying that this has been happening. After that, they will pull enough support from the forces outside India and they will directly go and launch a PIL in Supreme Court and as has been the case legal activism has been forte of this uh, men, uh, cabal and they have been gaining ground and support through these forms. So this dissent actually what I want to say is like this defense is, is like nothing but fake and there is no point that we should like even lend any credence to this. And men, this leftist ideology has, uh, there are just hardly five countries right now which conform to this communism or the communist ideology. And all other countries we, which has adopted this ideology have, are completely wiped off. 
and their uh, economies are now in doldrums. So, uh, even um, the Maoists who like uh, uh, really like uh, extol Maoism or China for various aspects. Internationally, China is labeled as not free country where like uh, the freedom of expression is totally scuttled and uh, then like uh, the kind of uh, the or the way this China is functioning or the CCP which is now taking over the country or taking charge uh, is just uh, clearly is a reflection to say that how an ideology can actually do to a country what an ideology can do to a country and further kind of a financial success or the economic rather to say the economic success um, uh, which China is now having it is all thanks to their capitalization or the just like by taking the capitalist principles they have like flourished a lot so uh, the descent uh, by now should be especially dismissed in the sense like uh, when it is a totally anti-Indian narrative and uh, further to add to the threat to the national security or the internet or internal security as such personally I am interested I was interested in this uh, Naxalism phenomenon because like I come from Andhra Pradesh or the no north coastal region of Andhra Pradesh which was badly affected by Naxalism or has been infested by Naxals. So, uh, I mean, um, Andhra Pradesh and Telangana, uh, now the Telangana, uh, they have been the hotbeds for these Naxals. And they, these Naxals thrived there because they, because of the feudalism. And in Telangana region, where the Nijams have uh, had uh, men, uh, they controlled the lands and the landless peasants were rendered helpless. So because of that kind of an frustration, this ma uh, this uh, Naxalism has taken roots in that place and has thrived well. But this uh, uh, and uh, men, uh, Naxalism which has always supported this armed struggle thrive well and people even actively supported this Naxalism till to 1900, till late 1990s. But after 1990s, when things started changing in the sense like uh, 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 the fruits of development began to slowly trickle into the interior regions, people st uh, started rebelling against these very Naxals only. Um, and uh, especially in our state, uh, even now, uh, people are sympathetic to Naxals. Uh, 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 the entire literature which thrives there mostly is the revolutionary literature or so called red literature. Even movies, several movies, especially in 80s and 90s were based on this red philosophy so to say. So there are still some pockets in India where this Naxalism is still thriving. Uh, thanks to the concerted efforts of government in the past three years, the, the geographical range where Naxals are operating has come down drastically. Um, and, uh, and I think this is one of the reasons why urban Naxals are also even feeling threatened in the sense because they are now, um, uh, the Naxals are now being uh, hunted down, kumbing op frequent kumbing operations have brought down the menace, even the um, casualties have also come down. So they are feeling like really crippled. Earlier all the foundations run by these uh, revolutionary um, writers were invited and government used to associate it, associate with these foundations. They used to have that kind of sense of entitlement. Now they lost that kind of sense of entitlement, they are feeling neglected 
and slowly as alternative narratives are bring, are building up and slowly they are coming to the foreground they are feeling threatened so all these shrill cries of dissent is just an after effect of all these factors combined thank you so much for giving this opportunity